Uh, I'll turn the floor to the CNSE staff for your presentation. As outlined in CMDs 18-M30 and 18-M30.A. Ms. Tadros, the floor is yours. Thank you and good afternoon, President Velchi, members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Heidi Tadros. I am the Director General of the Directorate of Nuclear Cycle and Facilities Regulation. My colleagues with me today to my left is Kavita Murthy, the Director of the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories Regulatory Program Division, and Ms. Nancy Greencorn, Project Officer on these files. Behind me we have Mr. Patrick Burton and Tiffany Lowe, also Project Officers on these files. We are joined by numerous subject matter experts who are familiar with today's files and who are available for any questions you may have at the end of our presentation. We are here to present Commission Member Document CMD 18M30, which provides an update on decommissioning and remediation activities being carried out by CNL at three prototype waste facilities, the White Shell Laboratories, and the Port Hope Air Initiative. We will also outline CNC staff's regulatory oversight activities associated with these files. Our presentation today will begin with a brief overview of the scope and purpose for this update. This will be followed by an update on each of the sites covered in the CMD, beginning with CNL's decommissioning projects and then with remediation activities. Just not certain if we have the slides up. We do. Thank you. The update will include information on activities undertaken since we last updated the Commission in 2016, CNSC staff's regulatory oversight of these activities, and next steps for each of these sites. Finally, we will provide areas of regulatory focus going forward and CNSC staff's conclusions. The notice of public hearing was published on CNSC's website on June 12, 2018. CNSC staff CMD was made available for public comment beginning on June 22nd for a 30-day period. As noted by President Velchi, a total of six interventions were received on the CMD. CNSC staff's dispositioning of five interventions are attached to the end of this presentation. The sixth intervention was received after the presentation was submitted to the Secretariat. Nevertheless, CNSC staff are available to answer any questions relating to the interventions received. As part of CNSC staff's commitment to keep the Commission and the public informed on the status of major projects authorized by CNSC licenses, CNSC staff CMD and this presentation provide an update on certain CNL facilities that are undergoing decommissioning and remediation activities. The scope of staff's presentation and progress updates includes the three shutdown power reactors, namely Douglas Point, Jean C. Un, and the nuclear power demonstration, White Shell Laboratories, as well as the Port Hope Area Initiative. CNSC staff last updated the Commission on these projects in April and November of 2016. Please note. CNL's proposed Near Surface Disposal Facility, or NSDF, has not been included in the scope of the CMD. This is because the NSDF is currently not a licensed facility. The NSDF project will be the subject of future public commission hearing. Today's update is for information only, and no decision is requested from the Commission. This slide shows the specific CNL licenses covered by this CMD. First are the three shutdown power reactors, which are currently covered by a single license. In July 2018, CNL requested that this license be split into three licenses, one license for each site. This request is administrative in nature and as the licensed activities and conditions of the license will not change. This request is in line with CNL's diverse decommissioning plans, and timelines for the three shutdown power reactors. Next is White Shell Laboratories. On August 1 of this year, CNL was issued a new one-year license for White Shell by a panel of the Commission, with no change to any authorizations or conditions from the previous license. The last four licenses are associated with the Port Hope Area Initiative. 
Two licenses cover the new long-term waste management facility sites, and two are for smaller sites where various legacy weights, wastes are stored. I will now turn the presentation over to Kavita Murthy, who will present an overview of CNSC's regulatory oversight activities. Thank you, Heidi. Good afternoon, President Welshi and members of the Commission. My name is Kavita Murthy, and I am the director of the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories Regulatory Program Division. This division was newly created on August 1st, 2018, and consolidates all of CNL's major licenses under one division. The CNSC regulates Canada's decommissioning facilities and remediation projects to protect the health, safety, and security of Canadians and the environment. The nature of this regulatory oversight is commensurate with the risk associated with the licensed sites or activities, the risk associated with each activity or program, and the performance of the licensee. The base level of risk is reflected in the CNSE staff's facility-specific compliance plans, which include the number and scope of inspections that we conduct. CNSE staff regularly review and revise these plans as required. In addition, CNSE staff monitor licensee performance through reviews of scheduled reports, such as annual compliance reports, as well as reports of events and incidents. Finally, the CNSE conducts its own independent environmental monitoring program, the IEMP, in publicly accessible areas in the vicinity of these sites. The table on this slide provides a summary of CNSC compliance and licensing efforts associated with, the, with these facilities from July 1, 2016 to April 1, 2018 for FE, and from January 1, 2016 to April 1, 2018 for the other sites. The information reported includes the number of inspections conducted and the total CNSE staff effort spent on compliance and licensing for each license. Note that the category of compliance effort includes both field inspections and CNSE staff desktop review of licensee documentation and programs. The relatively high level of effort at NPD and White Shell laboratories are due to the work that has been done on evaluating CN CNL's proposed decommissioning approach. This will be discussed later in more detail in this presentation. To complement existing and ongoing compliance activities, the CNSC has implemented its independent environmental monitoring program to verify that the public and environment around CNSE regulated sites are safe. This verification is achieved through independent sampling of publicly accessible lands and analysis of air, water, soil, vegetation, and various foods by CNSE staff. This slide shows CNSC staff's IEMP activities conducted in 2016 and 2017 at the sites covered by this CMD. Detailed sampling results can be found on CNSC's IEMP website. The IEMP results have confirmed that public and the environment around these sites and activities are protected. Last week, CNSC staff performed an IEMP sampling campaign in publicly accessible areas surrounding NPD, and those results will be posted on the CNSC's public website once they are analyzed and become available. To keep the public informed of regulatory activities occurring at decommissioning facilities and remediation sites, CNSC staff regularly engage with the public and indigenous groups through attendance at community meetings, open houses, and technical information sessions. During the reporting period, CNSC staff held five open houses at communities surrounding White Shell Laboratories and two open houses at communities surrounding the NPD site. CNSC staff participated in the 2016 Port Hope Fall Fair and will be participating in the 2018 edition of the Port Hope Fall Fair. 
Senesi staff met five times with the municipality of Port Hope and will meet with them monthly going forward. CNSC staff have also observed selected Port Hope Area Initiative citizen liaison group meetings. In addition to these outreach activities, information is also provided to the public through the CNSC's website, through social media, through CNSC online events, and presentations such as this one. This completes the regulatory oversight portion of this presentation. I will now pass the presentation to Ms. Nancy Greencorn, who will provide the progress update on CNL's decommissioning projects. Good afternoon, President Velshi and members of the Commission. My name is Nancy Greencorn, and I'm a senior project officer in the Waste Decommissioning Division. Today, I will present an overview of decommissioning projects and provide specific updates on the Douglas Point and John T1 shutdown power reactors. I'll begin with a brief description of the facilities being decommissioned. First are the shutdown power reactors, which are licensed as prototype waste facilities. These are the nuclear power demonstration in Rolfton, Ontario, Douglas Point in Tiverton, Ontario, and Jean T1 in Baie-Concourt, Quebec. They are called prototype because of their former role as prototype reactors. The current license for these solely authorizes storage with surveillance activities, a phase of decommissioning which I'll describe on the next slide. White Shell Laboratories was a nuclear research and test facility located near Pinawa, Manitoba. It included the WR1 reactor. The White Shell Laboratories license authorizes decommissioning and dismantling activities in accordance with detailed decommissioning plans approved for the site. CNL is using a deferred decommissioning approach to decommission the reactors for both the prototype facilities and the WR1 research reactor. The three phases of deferred decommissioning are as follows. Phase one is the phase that brings the facility to a safe, sustainable, shutdown, safe shutdown state which is suitable for transition to phase two. Key stabilization activities include defueling the reactor, draining cooling water from the primary and secondary systems, and transferring fuel to dry storage. This phase has been completed for all reactors covered by the CMD. Phase two is the storage with surveillance period, which is the current phase for each of these reactors. I will discuss this phase in more detail in the upcoming slides. Phase three is the period in which decommissioning occurs and where the facility achieves its final end state. The dates by which this is planned vary for each reactor and are discussed later in the presentation. Storage with surveillance is a phase of decommissioning during which the remaining nuclear substances, equipment, and the site itself are placed under controlled surveillance for a specific period of time. During this period, activities include hazard reduction, such as the removal of hazardous and radioactive substances from the accessible areas. During storage with surveillance, Activities are focused on care and maintenance, such as inspections and servicing, to confirm that structures, systems, and components needed to maintain safe storage are functioning as required. Examples of programs to be implemented and maintained by the licensee during storage with surveillance include radiation protection, environmental protection, occupational health and safety, and aging management. Physical systems in place during storage with surveillance may include electrical power, emergency lighting, heating and ventilation, security, and fire protection. This slide depicts the currently planned decommissioning timelines associated with the Douglas Point and Jean T1 reactors. The timelines are drawn from Canadian Nuclear Laboratories preliminary decommissioning plans for each facility. Please note that incorrect dates for the beginning of phase three 
were included in CMD 18 M30. The correct dates from the current preliminary decommissioning plans are shown on this slide and staff apologize for the error. Phase one, the safe shutdown phase is shown in blue. Phase two, the storage with surveillance phase is shown in green. And phase three, the decommissioning to end state period for the reactor is shown in orange. The proposed end state objectives for Douglas Point and Jean T1 are to return the sites for industrial free use. This slide depicts the decommissioning timelines associated with MPD and White Shell Laboratory sites. Similar to the previous slide, the three phases of decommissioning are shown. For the White Shell Laboratories, after completing the physical decommissioning activities, CNL has planned for a long-term institutional control period of 200 years or more, as shown in pink. The timelines are drawn from CNL's decommissioning plans for each facility. Please note that these timelines do not reflect CNL's ex proposed accelerated decommissioning approach, which I will speak to on the next slide. The matters discussed on this slide and the following slide will be the subject of a separate public commission hearing for both environmental assessment and licensing decisions the dates for which have not yet been determined. However, as these developments relate to the sites covered by this presentation, we will include the topic here for completeness. In 2017, CNL submitted to the CNSC request to revise the decommissioning strategy for the WR1 reactor and the MPD reactor to permit in situ decommissioning. That is, where remaining radioactive material is permanently encapsulated in place, effectively creating a waste repository. This is a change from the previous proposal to fully dismantle the reactors and disposition waste offsite as documented in the current detailed decommissioning plans. Commission approval is required before CNL implements these plans. Such license amendments is subject to a public hearing process. In addition to the changes in strategy, CNL has proposed accelerating decommissioning for these two sites. The timelines on this slide show the dates relevant to the EA and licensing process for CNL's in situ decommissioning proposals for MPD and White Shell. The two projects are currently undergoing an EA under the Canadian Environmental Assessment, CIA 2012. The CNSC is the sole responsible authority for the conduct of these EAs. Both projects are currently in the environmental impact statement and technical assessment review phase of an EA and licensing process. The Commission will render a decision on these projects following future public commission hearings. I will next present more detailed information on the shutdown power reactors, beginning with Douglas Point. The Douglas Point shutdown power reactor is located on the Bruce Power site in Tiverton, Ontario. It was a 200 megawatt can-do power reactor that was put into service in 1968 and permanently shut down in 1984. Phase one of decommissioning which brought the facility to a safe shutdown state took place from 1984 to 1988. During phase one, used nuclear fuel was transferred from the irradiated fuel bay to dry storage at the concrete canister storage facility that is located in an exterior area of the site. Since that time, the facility has been maintained in phase two storage with surveillance. As part of phase two storage with surveillance activities, CNL has undertaken hazard reduction work since our last update to the commission. This work included the safe transfer of approximately 134,000 liters of contaminated water that was stored in tanks at Douglas Point to the Chalk River Laboratory site, and the completion of characterization of ion exchange resins 
currently stored at Douglas Point. In addition, and according to detailed decommissioning plans approved by CNSC staff, CNL carried out non-nuclear decommissioning activities at Douglas Point. These included the demolition of the guardhouse, machine shop, plate shop, and tool grip. All waste generated was checked for radioactive contamination and cleared for release prior to shipment for recycling and or disposal at municipal landfills. CNSC staff carried out inspections and documented reviews to confirm that this work was carried out in accordance with the DDPs. Over the period covered by this CMD, CNSC staff conducted four inspections at the Douglas Point site. All actions raised during these inspections have been closed. The current preliminary decommissioning plan for the Douglas Point facility shows that the site will remain in storage with surveillance until the year 2060. If CNL wishes to alter this timeline, decommissioning plans would have to be submitted to the CNSC staff. A public hearing, commission hearing is required if CNL plans to carry out decommissioning of nuclear structures. As described by CNL in their presentation, moving forward, CNL will continue with hazard reduction activities, such as asbestos abatement, and reduce the footprint of the Douglas Point facility by demolishing additional non-nuclear facilities. CNSC staff will continue to maintain an appropriate level of oversight at CNL's work at Douglas Point, including review of upcoming building-specific detailed decommissioning plans. I will now move on to Jean T. Wong. The Jean T1 shutdown power reactor, or G1, is located adjacent to the shutdown Jean T2 reactor in Baconcourt, Quebec, 15 kilometers east of Trois Rivières. G1 was a 250 megawatt can do boiling water reactor prototype that was put into service in 1972 and operated until 1978. Between 1984 and 1986, phase one, or preparation for storage with surveillance, decommissioning activities were conducted. As part of phase one, used nuclear fuel was transferred to the spent fuel canister area located inside the turbine building. Since that time, the facility has been maintained in a state of storage with surveillance. Areas currently under CNL's license include the reactor building, basement of the service building, and two-thirds of the turbine building. Since the last update to the Commission, the following hazard reduction work has been undertaken. Since early 2018, iron exchange resins that were, were retrieved from underground vaults that they have been stored for the last 30 years and transferred to Chalk River Laboratories for storage. In March of 2018, CNSC staff conducted an inspection at G1 site and observed the resin retrieval process. CNSC staff noted a number of good practices by the licensee in the fields of radiation protection, conventional health and safety, and management systems. Furthermore, CNL is progressively dispositioning low-level waste stored in the reactor building. 45,000 kilograms of waste have been safely packaged and transferred to a licensed waste processing facility. Following processing, the residues will be sent to CNL for storage. In addition, asbestos, asbestos abatement work has been carried out in both the turbine building and the reactor building. Over the period covered by this CMD, CNSC staff conducted three inspections at G1, and all actions raised are now considered closed. The current preliminary decommissioning plan for G1 shows that the site will remain in storage with surveillance until the year 2064. If, CNS, if CNL wishes to alter this timeline, decommissioning plans will have to be submitted to the CNSC staff. A public commission hearing is required if CL, CNL plans to carry out dismantling work. Looking forward for the G1 facility, 
CNSC staff expects that CNL will continue with hazard reduction activities such as asbestos abatement and retrieval and disposition of low-level wastes. CNSC staff will continue to maintain an appropriate level of oversight at CNL's work at G1, including the review of a revised preliminary decommissioning plan. Now we will pass the presentation to my colleague, Ms. Tiffany Lowe. Good afternoon, President Velshi and members of the Commission. My name is Tiffany Lowe. I am a project officer in the Canadian Nuclear Laboratory's Regulatory Program Division. I will now speak to you about the Nuclear Power Demonstration Reactor, also known as NPD. NPD is located in Ralston, Ontario, approximately 25 kilometers from Chalk River Laboratories, CRL. It was a 20 megawatt can-do reactor that was put in service in 1962 and remained in operation until shut down in 1987. Phase 1 preparation for storage activities were conducted from 1984 to 1986. And since that time, it has been maintained in a Phase 2 shutdown with surveillance state. After shutdown of the reactor, all used nuclear fuel and ion exchange resins were transported to CRL. However, the reactor core and its related components remained in place. CNL is currently carrying out a number of CNSC authorized preparatory activities for final decommissioning at NPD. In June of 2017, CNL completed the removal of accessible asbestos from the site's boiler room. CNL also completed several characterization activities of the facility structure and systems during the reporting period. This includes the primary heat transport and moderator system, the reactor system, and the building structure. Health and safety related improvements made include repair to, repairs to ladders, railings, and platforms throughout the facility, along with relocating the personal protective equipment change room and radiation protective storage area. CNSC staff carried out two inspections for the reporting period and found that CNL were implementing their programs consistent with CNSC requirements. All actions raised are considered closed. CNSC staff will continue to maintain an appropriate level of oversight on CNL's work at MPD. On September 29, 2017, CNL applied for a license amendment to revise the decommissioning approach to allow for in situ decommissioning for the MPD facility. CNL proposes to grout and encapsulate below grade structures to contain remaining reactor components and residual radioactive and hazardous materials. CNL has submitted a draft environmental impact statement, or EIS as required under CIA 2012. CNSC staff, other federal and provincial departments, indigenous communities, and the public have reviewed the draft EIS. And more than 600 comments were provided to CNL. Information related to this project are available on the CNSC website and are updated on a regular basis. This concludes CNSC staff's update on the three shutdown power reactors. I will next discuss the progress update for White Shell Laboratories. CNL's White Shell Laboratories are located about 100 kilometers north, northeast of Winnipeg, Manitoba. The White Shell Laboratories site operated from 1962 until 2003, when the Commission first issued a decommissioning license for the site. The figure on the right shows the White Shell main campus. It consists of the, White it consists of the WR1 reactor, Slowpoke demonstration reactor, and various research laboratories. The White Shell site is currently undergoing decommissioning activities, and the, and the WR1 reactor is in storage with surveillance state. CNL is currently carrying out a number of CNSC authorized decommissioning activities at the White Shell site. These include demolition of stages 4 and 7 of the research building B300 as shown on the pictures in the slide. In 2017, CNL completed 
decommissioning and demolition of the decontamination center. CNL also disassembled the low-level waste circuits in the, in the active liquid waste treatment center and is in preparation for building demolition. Furthermore, final dismantlement of the slowpoke demonstration reactor with the exception of the stainless steel pool liner was completed in 2016. Recent hazard reduction activities performed at the WR1 reactor building include removal of asbestos in accessible areas and characterization of reactor components. In addition, CNL is carrying out a number of decommissioning activities at the waste management area. As discussed in CNL's presentation, in 2017, preparation work has begun for the extraction of waste from the intermediate level waste bunkers and standpipes. Since 2016, CNL is also completing waste segregation and repackaging. Most WR1 and other radioactive and conventional waste from the waste management area have been sorted, repackaged, and transferred to on-site storage. In July 2018, an order was issued by CNSC staff to CNL on matter pertaining to nuclear security at the White Shell site. CNL is taking measures to address the order under regulatory oversight from CNSC staff. CNSC staff conducted six inspections at the White Shell Laboratories during the reporting period. Actions raised were of low safety significance and are being addressed through normal compliance processes. On September 1, 2017, CNL submitted a renewal application for White Shell Laboratories decommissioning license. As part of the as part of the application, CNL proposed a new decommissioning approach to allow for in situ decommissioning of the WR1 reactor. On September 15, 2017, CNL provided a draft EIS as required under CIA 2012. CNSC staff, other federal and provincial departments, indigenous communities, and the public have reviewed the draft EIS, and more than 400 comments are were provided to CNL. Updates related to this project are available on the CNSC website. <laughs> to enable CNL to adequately address comments on the draft EIS, in March 2018, CNL requested to renew their current license for a one-year period with no changes to any authorizations from the, from the previous license. On August 1st of this year, the Commission granted a one-year license to CNL for the White Shell Laboratory site, which is valid from January 1st to December 31st, 2019. CNL continues to address comments on the draft EIS and provide additional documentation to support their safety case for in situ decommissioning. EIS comments provided to CNL are publicly available on the CIA website. Once the EIS is finalized, CNSC staff will then prepare an EA report for consideration by the Commission. Note that both the EA and the license amendment application will be subject to decisions made by the Commission at a future date through a public hearing process. This concludes the progress update on the, de on the decommissioning projects. I will now pass the presentation to my colleague, Mr. Patrick Burton. Good afternoon, President Velshi and members of the Commission. My name is Patrick Burton and I'm a Senior Project Officer in the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories Regulatory Program Division. I'm here today to speak to you about CNL's remediation projects carried out under the Port Hope Area Initiative. The Port Hope Area Initiative, or PHAI, is a, product, a project to develop and implement a safe, local, long-term management solution for historic low-level radioactive waste in the municipalities of Port Hope and Clarington, both of which are in Ontario. The PHAI is comprised of two main projects, the Port Hope project and the Port Granby project. Each includes the construction of a new long-term waste management facility, or LTWMF, and a wastewater treatment plant. Both projects involve the remediation of low-level radioactive waste from a legacy waste management facility, and the Port Hope project 
also involves the remediation of low-level radioactive waste from numerous other sites in the Port Hope community. The scope of the PHAI is defined by a legal agreement between the Government of Canada and the affected municipalities. The legal agreement was originally signed in 2001 and has been amended several times since. The CNSC is not a party to the legal agreement and does not enforce its terms. The low-level radioactive waste being cleaned up came from historic radium and uranium refining activities in Port Hope dating back to the 1930s. These wastes are a federal liability because they were produced by Eldorado Nuclear Limited, a former Crown Corporation. In 1988, Eldorado Nuclear became Chemical Corporation and so wastes produced after that time are not eligible for disposal via the PHAI. The Port Hope Area Initiative represents the Government of Canada's commitment to the remediation of historic low-level radioactive waste in the municipalities of Port Hope and Clarington. The Government of Canada has committed $1.28 billion towards this project. CNSC staff's role in the implementation of the PHAI is to ensure that the Port Hope and Port Granby projects are carried out safely and in accordance with CNSC regulations and their respective licenses. In order to ensure an appropriate level of oversight, a CNSC project officer has been temporarily stationed in the Port Hope region. Both the Port Hope and Port Granby LTWMFs are modern facilities. Each consists of multiple cells into which waste will be placed, Port Granby having two cells and Port Hope three, as shown in the picture on the slide. The waste in these cells is prevented from escaping into the environment by a multi-layered base liner system. Contaminated water, which is created when rain falls on the exposed waste in the cells, is treated using reverse osmosis water treatment plants, one each at Port Hope and Port Granby, before being released to the environment. Once full, the two LTWMFs will be capped with covers which are conceptually similar to the base liner system. The LTWMFs in their end state will resemble large grassy hills and they will remain seen as sea licensed sites. I'll now speak to both the Port Hope and Port Granby projects in detail, beginning with the Port Granby project. A high level schedule for the Port Granby project is shown on the screen, including some of the tasks under each of the three phases of the project. I'll note here that the term phase, when used for the PHAI, is not connected with the reactor decommissioning phases discussed earlier in this presentation. The Port Granby project involves the remediation of wastes stored in the old Port Granby Waste Management Facility, which is located several hundred meters to the south of the new LTWMF and is immediately adjacent to Lake Ontario. On the schedule, you can see that the Port Granby project is currently nearing the end of phase two, the implementation phase. Phase two sees CNL excavating legacy waste from the old Port Granby Waste Management Facility, transporting that waste to the new Port Granby LTWMF and remediating the excavated areas. CNL is also treating contaminated water from both the old Waste Management Facility and the new LTWMF and preparing for the capping of the LTWMF mound. CNL expects to transition to phase three in 2019 or 2020. Based on CNL's estimated timeline, Phase three of the Port Granby project will likely begin before the end of the current license period. The current license permits CNL to progress to phase three without seeking additional approvals. Since the last update to the commission on the Port Granby project, CNL has made significant progress. CNL estimates that roughly 50% of wastes at the old Port Granby waste management facility have been excavated and transported to the new Port Granby LTWMF. CNL has found that the volume of waste needing to be excavated has been greater than expected, in some areas by as much as 25%. CNL nonetheless expects the final volume of the Port Granby LTWMF to be within its original design parameters, which included a certain contingency volume. Excavations have progressed to the point that CNL has verified that portions of the old waste management facility site meet the cleanup criteria in the Port Granby project license. As shown in the lower photo on this slide, CNL has backfilled some of these areas and seeded them with grass. CNSC staff have verified during inspections that CNL has processes in place to measure the mass and volume of waste being excavated and emplaced 
to ensure that the approved design of the LTWMF is respected. CNSC staff have also carried out inspections and document reviews focused on CNL's verification of the remediation of the old Port Granby Waste Management Facility. Water management is an extremely important part of the Port Granby project. The project required a new wastewater treatment plant which became operational in 2016. It removes a wider range of contaminants and with improved treatment efficiency as compared to the legacy system. To verify the performance of the plant, CNL collects weekly samples of influent and effluent and sends them to an accredited lab for analysis against a variety of contaminants. Toxicity testing is also carried out monthly. CNL has recently established release limits and action levels for the Port Granby wastewater treatment plant, which were calculated using a year of actual effluent data. Action levels are the lower of the two and are used by CNL to determine if there could be a loss of control in the wastewater treatment plant process. Release limits are the higher of the two and exceeding a release limit would be a non-compliance with the license. CNSC staff considers CNL's release limits and action levels to be acceptable. CNSC staff have taken independent samples of effluent from the Port Granby wastewater treatment plant and have verified that CNL is accurately reporting on its performance. Since the last update to the Commission, there have been water management challenges at Port Granby. In June of 2017, an overflow occurred at the East Gorge Reservoir during a heavy rainfall, which released untreated water to the environment. This was reported to the Commission in an event initial report in August of 2017 as CMD 17-M38. An overflow occurred at the Port Hope LTWMF on the same day, which will be discussed later. In January of 2018, a blocked pipe led to an overflow at the West Gorge Reservoir, again releasing untreated water to the environment. Both of these reservoirs are shown on the figure in orange, and as you can see, they are adjacent to Lake Ontario. Samples were taken from the overflow area and analyzed by CNL and CNSC staff. These results lead CNSC staff to conclude that there was no impact to the public or the environment from these overflows. In both cases, the volume of water released was relatively low and it flowed across areas which CNL will remediate if necessary. CNSC staff nonetheless consider both to have been serious events and have closely monitored CNL's corrective actions. In addition to the two overflow events, earlier in 2018, CNL was faced with a critical shortage of water storage space with virtually all of their reservoirs close to capacity. Snow melt and early spring rains led to the generation of greater volumes of contaminated water than had been foreseen during the planning of the project. At one point, CNL contemplated an intentional release to the environment of untreated water as a measure of last resort. In response to the East and West Gorge Reservoir overflows, CNSC staff carried out inspections of CNL's water management practices. These have resulted in enforcement actions against CNL. CNSC staff have been satisfied with CNL's implementation of corrective actions. In response to the progressively worsening water storage situation, in May of 2018, CNSC staff made a request of CNL under Section 12.2 of the General Nuclear Safety and Control Regulations. The request was for CNL to conduct an analysis of the mitigation and compensatory measures being considered by CNL to address water management at the Port Granby project site and provide a report that demonstrates that the proposed alternatives are within the safety case approved by the Commission. In response to the difficult conditions at the site and CNSC staff's enforcement actions, CNL has taken numerous steps to improve the water management situation at the site. They have increased water storage capacity nearly five-fold by over 45,000 cubic meters. They have reduced the flow of clean water into the Port Granby Waste Management Facility, preventing it from becoming contaminated and requiring treatment. They have purchased a portable water treatment system, which will roughly double CNL's water treatment capacity at Port Granby. Lastly, they have modified the wastewater treat plant intake so it draws cleaner water from the surface of a storage pond, which can be treated at higher flow rates than more contaminated water from the bottom. Similarly to CNL's presentation, this slide shows the evolution of water management features at the Port Granby LTWMF site. The photo on the left shows these as, as originally designed. 
the double pond visible just below the center of the photo is the 11,500 cubic meter equalization pond. The right hand photo shows six large circular water tanks and roughly 130 smaller water tanks. This extra water storage capacity represents a significant and unforeseen cost to CNL and water management concerns have had impacts on the Port Granby project schedule. CNSC staff consider that CNL's execution of their excavation plan was a contributing factor to the shortage of water storage capacity at Port Granby. The plan was originally developed to limit areas of contaminated land under excavation and to divert surface water away from the excavation area. Since encountering water storage capacity issues, CNL's response at Port Granby has been fully satisfactory. They have added considerable extra storage and treatment capacity in a short period of time to safely draw down water levels and avoid further issues. This concludes CNSC staff's discussion of water management at Port Granby. Since the previous report to the Commission, there have been three instances at the Port Granby project where workers have been exposed to hazardous substances. The first took place in December of 2016 when an old drum was ruptured during excavation. Two workers suffered temporary respiratory irritation as a result of exposure to an ammonia bearing substance. The second took place in January of 2017 when workers were exposed to hydrogen sulfide gas while removing solid waste from the bioreactor portion of the wastewater treatment plant. Two workers exhibited short term symptoms such as headaches. The third took place in May of 2017 when workers were excavating a gas cylinder in an area known to likely contain cylinders of hydrogen fluoride gas. These excavations were performed using hydrovac trucks to minimize the risk of mechanical damage to cylinders. During excavations, hydrogen fluoride was detected by on-site air monitoring equipment at low levels. As per protocol, Workers evacuated the area and returned in an elevated class of personal protective equipment to safely excavate the cylinder. In response to the December 2016 ammonia exposure, CNL placed a multi-month halt on all excavations in Port Granby while strengthened protocols were put in place. Air tanks were retrofitted to key pieces of excavation equipment so that drivers no longer breathe outside air. These are the yellow tanks visible on the roof of the bulldozer in the photo on the slide. Workers who are on foot near active excavations must wear personal protective equipment which offers high levels of respiratory protection. In the wastewater treatment plant, CNL performed an audit which resulted in numerous recommendations regarding hydrogen sulfide monitoring as well as ventilation and radiation protection zoning. CNSC staff have performed inspections to confirm that CNL has implemented corrective actions across these areas. One inspection indicated that CNL had yet to implement some corrective actions raised in their hydrogen sulfide audit and in response CNSC staff placed a prohibition on CNL's use of the bioreactor portion of the wastewater treatment plant until relative, relevant corrective actions are complete. CNSC staff continue to evaluate CNL's implementation of remaining corrective actions, but conclude that the site is safe. Looking forward for the Port Granby project, CNSC staff expect that CNL will continue the excavation and emplacement of waste into 2019. CNL has recently applied for a license amendment for the Port Granby project with the goals of modernizing the license and including release limits for the wastewater treatment plant into the licensing basis. This license amendment will be considered by a designated officer as provided for by the Commission at the last Port Granby licensing hearing in 2011. CNL will continue to operate the wastewater treatment plant into phase three. CNL will also continue with remedial verification activities in more areas of the old Port Granby waste management facility, which will open the path to backfilling more areas with clean fill. Lastly, CNL will continue to prepare for the capping of the Port Granby LTWMF. This is currently expected to begin in 2019 or 2020. That concludes the Port Granby portion of the presentation. I'll now discuss the Port Hope project. Again, a high level project for the Port Hope, a high level schedule for the Port Hope project is shown on the screen, including some of the tasks under each of the three phases of the project. The three phases are essentially the same as for Port Granby. In Port Hope, the largest volume of waste to be remediated is found at the old Welcome Waste Management Facility, which is co-located with the new LTWMF. 
The most important difference between the Port Hope and Port Granby projects is that in Port Hope, waste is also present throughout the town. CNL is performing an extensive series of radiological surveys of residential and commercial properties in Port Hope to confirm the presence or absence of low-level radioactive waste. As with Port Granby, the Port Hope project is also in phase two, the implementation phase, but is less advanced in terms of the overall schedule. The term of the current license is expected to expire before CNL is prepared to transition the Port Hope project to phase three. The relicensing process for the Port Hope project will require a public hearing before the Commission. Since the previous update to the Commission, CNL has made significant progress on the Port Hope project. This has included the construction of the base liner system for cell one, a process which was verified several times by CNSC staff to ensure that the system was installed as designed. A license amendment was granted in late 2017, which permits CNL to employ an alternate strategy for areas of the site with concentrations of arsenic above the cleanup criteria in the license. With the issuance of that license amendment, CNL was able to begin excavating on-site waste from the old welcome waste management facility and in placing that waste in cell one of the new LTWMF. Excavation of on-site waste is now nearly complete and CNL has progressed to the verification of remediation of those areas, which is a prerequisite for the construction of cell two. CNL is con CNL's construction of infrastructure such as internal roads, unloading docks and truck waste scales uh, further has allowed them to receive their first shipment of off-site waste in June of 2018. Similar to Port Granby, CNL has constructed a new wastewater treatment plant at the Port Hope LTWMF. It has been operational since January of 2016 and it treats ground and surface water from the LTWMF site. It removes a wider range of contaminants and with improved, uh, improved treatment efficiency compared to the old water treatment building used in the past. As at Port Granby, CNL collects weekly samples of influent and effluent from the new wastewater treatment plant and sends them to an accredited lab for analysis against a variety of contaminants. Toxicity testing is also carried out monthly. CNL has recently established action levels for the Port Hope wastewater treatment plant, which were calculated using a year of actual effluent data. CNSC staff consider CNL's action levels to be acceptable. On July 31 of this year, CNL submitted release limits for CNSC staff review. Once finalized, these release limits will be included in the licensing basis for the Port Hope project. CNSC staff have taken independent samples of effluent from the Port Hope wastewater treatment plant and have verified that CNL is accurately reporting on its performance. In contrast to Port Granby, in Port Hope, the old, waste, the old water treatment building remains in place and operable as part of CNL's water management and contingency plan. This will be discussed further in the coming slides. CNL has also faced water management challenges at the Port Hope site. In June of 2017, heavy rainfall led to an overflow from the south treatment pond, which released untreated water to the environment. This was the same day as the East Gorge Reservoir overflow at Port Granby, and both were reported to the Commission in an event initial report in August of 2017 as CMD 17 M38. The results of subsequent samples taken by both CNSC staff and CNL were consistent with the original environmental assessment of the area, leading CNSC staff to conclude that there was no impact to the public or environment from this overflow. CNSC staff nonetheless consider this to have been a serious event and have closely monitored CNL's corrective actions. Earlier in 2018, CNL was faced with a critical shortage of water storage space in Port Hope, with virtually all of their reservoirs at capacity. In contrast to Port Granby, there is no space at the Port Hope LTWMF for the addition of significant temporary water storage tanks. In response to the June 2017 overflow, CNSC staff carried out an immediate reactive inspection, which resulted in an inspector's order being issued to CNL. The order required CNL to immediately review its water management program to ensure that adequate storage capacity is available and to ensure that it had sufficient emergency supplies to mitigate releases of untreated water. In response to the order, CNL updated their water management and contingency plans for both the Port Hope and Port Granby sites. At Port Hope, this plan includes provision for the operation of the old water treatment building in emergency situations. 
In early 2018, CNL operated the old water treatment building for 39 days over May and April in parallel with the new wastewater treatment plant. This allowed them to treat and release the excess water stored on the site to the point of completely emptying the west collection pond. This was a necessary step in CNL's project to expand the collection ponds to prevent future water storage issues. CNL has recently informed CNSC staff that they have successfully expanded the collection pond nearly threefold from 18,000 cubic meters to 47,500 cubic meters. CNSC staff consider that the conditions of the order have been met. CNSC staff have incorporated water management aspects into subsequent inspections at the Port Hope LTWMF. CNL's operation of the old water treatment building is permitted by the current Port Hope project license. Now that the expansion of the, of the collection pond is complete, CNSC staff expect that the old water treatment building will no longer be required. CNSC staff continue to closely monitor CNL's water management practices at the Port Hope LTWMF site. I'll now move on to remediation at some of the various other sites in Port Hope. In addition to the old welcome waste management facility, over the years, low-level radioactive waste has been consolidated at several major known sites in Port Hope. Under the legal agreement, CNL will clean up these sites and transport the waste to the Port Hope LTWMF. A table of these sites is presented on the next slide. CNL is currently working with Cameco on the largest of these sites, the center pier area between the Port Hope Harbor and the Ganaraska River. Shipments from the center pier were among the first receipts of, op of off-site waste at the Port Hope LTWMF in June of this year. Removal of wastes stored on the center pier will permit preparations for the remediation of the Port Hope Harbor, Harbor later in 2018. CNL expects remediation at these sites to be complete by the end of phase two, currently projected for 2023. On the slide, you'll notice a large black tarp. CNL recently notified CNSC staff that excavations of that material should be completed by the end of this week. This slide shows a list of major sites which will be subject to remediation under the PHAI, along with dates when remediation is expected to begin. This list includes the Highland Drive landfill, which contains both low-level radioactive waste and municipal household garbage, which can generate gases as it decomposes. For this reason, cell 3 at the Port Hope LTWMF has been specially designed to accept these materials. Some of the major sites are covered by separate CNSC licenses issued by a designated officer. These are the Port Hope Radioactive Waste Management Facility, covering mounds of low-level radioactive waste at several locations, and the Pine Street Extension Temporary Storage Facility, covering two mounds in a small building. The transfer of waste from these sites will begin in 2018 and will continue for some years. CNL intends to continue using the Pine Street Extension Temporary Storage Facility to receive waste from the construction monitoring program until close to the end of phase two, at which point the waste will be transferred to the Port Hope LTWMF. CNL's construction monitoring program identifies and excavates low-level radioactive waste from construction projects in Port Hope, such as the digging of backyard pools. As mentioned earlier, the Port Hope project includes the remediation of low-level radioactive waste at residential and commercial properties throughout Port Hope. These are termed small-scale sites, and they are best defined as sites which are found to have low-level low radioactive waste, but which are not specifically named in the legal agreement. In order to determine which properties need remediation, CNL is currently undertaking an extensive sampling campaign. For each property where low-level radioactive waste is found, CNL will prepare a site-specific remediation plan which will be presented to the property owner for discussion prior to remediation. The degree of remediation required will vary considerably from property to property. The CNSC project officer deployed to the region will allow CNSC staff to maintain effective oversight of CNL's small-scale remediation work. Looking forward for the Porto project, CNSC staff expect CNL to continue and expand their excavation and emplacement of wastes. CNL will also begin verifying the effectiveness of their remediation work, beginning at several trial small-scale sites. Water management at the LTWMF site will remain an area of focus, as will water management at other sites during their remediation. 
The remediation of the Port Hope Harbor will be an area of particular interest to CNSC staff. CNSC staff will also be reviewing CNL's recently submitted release limits for the wastewater treatment plant and incorporating those into the Port Hope project licensing basis once they are final. The CNSC project officer deployed to the Port Hope area will provide regulatory oversight for all of these activities. The Port Hope project license will expire in 2022, requiring a public license renewal hearing before the commission. With that, I will pass the presentation back to Ms. Haiti Tadros to offer CNSC staff's conclusions. Thank you. This slide presents key areas of regulatory focus going forward pertaining to CNL's decommissioning and remediation projects discussed today. So to recap, for the shutdown power reactors, CNSC staff will focus on compliance verification activities and oversight of CNL storage or surveillance activities. And CNSC staff will also review CNL's request for license amendments to separate the current license into three separate licenses. For the White Shell Laboratory, CNSC staff will focus on compliance verification activities and oversight of CNL's decommissioning activities and review of licensing basis documentation related to CNL's license amendment request. For CNL's proposed decommissioning of WR1 and NPD, CNSC staff continue to review and evaluate for sufficiency the EIS information for CNL's proposed revised decommissioning plans. As for the remediation project, CNSC staff continue compliance verification and oversight of the excavation and emplacement of waste at Port Hope and Port Granby, as well as CNL's operation of the wastewater treatment plants at both those sites. CNSC staff conclude that all of the sites covered by this CMD, namely Douglas Point, Jean C. Un, Nuclear Power Demonstration, White Shell Laboratories, and the Port Hope Area Initiative. CNL is carrying out licensed activities in compliance with regulatory requirements of the Nuclear Safety and Control Act, CNSC regulations, and the relevant licenses. As mentioned in the previous slide, CNSC staff will continue to maintain an effective level of regulatory oversight over these licensed activities to ensure that the public and the environment remain protected. CNSC staff will continue to ensure that the public and Indigenous groups continue to have multiple opportunities for meaningful engagement in CNSC processes. Thank you for your attention. We are available to take any questions you may have. Thank you.